What inspires an author who was raised on a sheep farm in the Newfoundland Highlands? Let's find out. Hi, my name is Crystal Fletcher and welcome to All About Books. If you love books and you've come to the right channel, because not only do you get to meet the person behind the book, you also get to find out what inspired them to write it. To keep up to date with the latest author interviews and behind the scenes stories, please hit that subscribe button. I am thrilled today to have the lovely award-winning author, screenwriter, and educator Bridget Canning with us. Uh, we'll discuss her latest novel, Some People's Children, which was published by Breakwater Books. And to give you a little taste about what her novel is about, this is what the back jacket says. Imogene Tubbs has never met her father and, ra and raised by her grandmother, she only sees her mother sporadically. But as she grows older, she learns that many people in her small rural town believe her father is Cecil Jesso, the local drug dealer, a man both feared and ridiculed. Weaving through a maze of gossip community, and the complications of family. Some People's Children is a revealing and liberating novel about the way others look at us and the power of self-discovery. Welcome to All About Books, Bridget. Hi, it's so great to be here. <laughs> well, I am thrilled to have you and excited about asking you some questions. I just this, the Newfoundland Highlands, like I just get this beautiful picture of where you grew up. It's actually just called Highlands Newfoundland, so it's oh. not really a particular part of Newfoundland that is oh, the, okay. Um, one of the only Scottish settled communities in the province, and the so the original settlers came from they came from Scotland, I think. I'm probably, I'm probably gonna get corrected on this. Uh, I believe some, many of them came through, they came to Cape Breton first and then they came down here. So it's named after Highlands, Scotland, but it's not okay. actually a geographic, like Highlands place. Like it's, it's um, um, I mean, I grew up on the beach. <laughs> 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 right across, right across from the water. And you can see the Port of Port Peninsula kind of uh, from my, you know, in, in over, over the water across, across the bay from my house. So, oh. uh, it's more named after, uh, it's more in homage of Highland Scotland. Oh, Scotland. I love it. But did you find that growing up on a sheep farm, was it a hard transition to move to St. John's? Uh, n well, no, not particularly. Um, it was kind of, uh, my parents met, my parents weren't from, that area, uh, they met in Churchill Falls, and my mother's from Toronto, and my father was from Marachine Island in Placentia. So Marachine Island is a uh, what, uh, an island that was in, it's in Placentia Bay, and it was one of the islands that was resettled through the Smallwood government, where they had they got people to take, come from those communities and move on to the the, the island, uh, so they'd be prop you know for infrastructure, so that people would be closer to schools and hospitals and things. Right. And so they were from very different places, and my mother grew up uh, you know young of Finch in Toronto. And they met working in Churchill Falls and they had this kind of dream of starting a farm. So they bought land in Highlands. And so I lived there, like we lived, we had the farm until probably 1989, 1990. My father passed away in 88. So mm -hmm. we ended up selling, you know, my mother was, was working. So we ended up selling, uh, selling all the, the livestock and the sheep. Uh, so when, by the time I graduated high school we were still living there but we didn't have like the farm wasn't running anymore mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so it was more of i think uh i was in a very different mindset then like you know to start something new i think we all were kind of in uh the, the frame that you know we all uh like i did i didn't my family didn't move but my sister and i both moved to st john's to go to school and then my mother also went back to school and then anyway so it was kind of a transitionary Part, so I, I wouldn't say it was too much of like a huge adjustment because I think it was one we were prepared for. Right, right. Okay, so back, I'll, I'll go, back, go back to your book now. So Bridget, what inspired you to write Some People's Children? 
Uh, it was a n number of things. Um, oh my goodness, what inspired me? I think uh, when, when it, the, the idea that someone could be raised as a product of gossip, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, living in this small place, living in small communities is wonderful for that sense of community and sense of being part of something and knowing your neighbors and having that, and having, you know, a certain sense of security and things like that. Um, but there is also the aspect that people think they know you and there's, and I, and I tend to kind of think a lot, you know, I think in stories, I think in anecdotes and things like that. So the idea of when your identity is being developed and there's the story that you tell yourself and the stories that your family tells each other and also the stories that other people tell about you. And, um, and I, and also I think, you know, she's when it's when the book starts imaging is at that age where you're kind of you know she's on the cusp of adolescence like she's about to become a teenager and i think that's the part of when, when you're when you're that age you start realizing like oh these are the ways that adults talk these are the stories that adults tell each other and so when she become when she starts to realize that like oh the story that i've been told about who i am is very different from what everyone else thinks i am and i you know and i've I've known people like that my, in, in, in my life. Uh, and I've known, you know, and I think all of us have experienced that at one point or another. So I kind of really wanted to kind of play with that. Um, with uh, so that, that inspired me. Plus, um, I really wanted to write a coming of age story of that particular time and that particular type of place. Because I mean, that's uh, a lot what I experienced in my generation experience. It's, uh, I mean, I graduated uh, high school in 1992, which was the year of the COD moratorium, so that there was that real feeling of, you know, you're stepping out into the world and you're going off to school, and there was a real feeling of, what are we going to do? Like, there's no jobs, or the feelings that you have to yeah. leave. So there was, I want, I want, I knew I wanted to write about that. I knew I wanted to write about the ideas of stories and gossip, and um, and I knew I wanted to write about a place where your connections with people are kind of determined by, uh, well, there's just not a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, you go, you know, like, so the, the people that you play with as children and the people that you date and the people mm -hmm. that you fight with and your, your friends and enemies kind of become this kind of fluctuating circle. Mm -hmm. And I've, and, uh, and, and, and I really like, sorry, I'm rambling now, but I really no. also really like the idea of writing about characters who aren't uh, good and bad and villains and heroes and things like that. And I, and I like the idea that by writing about people who all kind of exist in the same circle and play different parts in each other's lives, you can kind of, sometimes they are villains and sometimes they're not. Sometimes they're your friends. So, so yeah, but a, a lot of that. So it's kind of it's kind of like by writing something in a small place in a, a certain frame of time, you're able to kind of address a lot of other bigger bigger things you want to talk about. And <laughs> no, that's great. <laughs> and I really enjoyed your characters, like the depth of what you develop them in this small town. And I'm very intrigued by your character development process because I understand that you use a template and I have used yes I do um I'm actually running something now and I haven't used it yet uh but yeah I like to kind of uh, you mean the questionnaire that I use yes yeah I um, love I love that one of the questions that I understand you use is um the character what kind of door would they be and I got that idea from a workshop I did with Cassie Stocks a few years ago. I believe that was one of the questions she asked. If you want to compare, basically what it does is it forces you to think about your character as, you know, a, a manifested kind of person. So if you're going to compare this person to a door, what kind of door is it? I, and I love that. And I think one of the other questions was, what does your character have in his pocket, in, in his or her, their pockets? Ah. Um, so it's, I, I like doing that because it forces you to kind of, think of them independently so you yes. kind of for me it kind of takes the character out of the story and then i just think about that character and then i put them back in no i think that's fantastic i've never heard of it i'm like i'm gonna try that <laughs> it's fun to do yeah i've done workshops where i've done that and i've also done things like um well you kind of uh 
I think I think some of the other questions I've made for for it is um, are things like you know if they were going to play what kind of games would they play like what kind of apps do they have on their phone? Yeah. You know, so just think of something we can think about now. Like if you're going to look at this person's cell phone, because we all have things that are very much in our pockets and are very private. Yes. So what kind of things do they look at? What kind of things do they play with? What kind of things do they, you know, um, use to distract themselves? Yeah. Yeah, no, I thought I thought that was so fun because it's it's such a different way of looking at it as opposed to what color is their hair, <laughs> you know. But no, I thought that was great, and certainly um, I I really loved you know Imogene this coming of coming of age story, you know as a reader when I was following along her journey like it just took me right back to ad adolescence and I was thinking. You know, no, Imogene, no, 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 don't do it. Or, Imogene, you know, just say something, say something, you, you know, use your voice. And um, as a writer, like, could you tell us, like, I mean, you're an experienced adult. Was it really, like, did you want to intervene and help her through all the sloppy adolescent stuff? <laughs> uh, yes and no. Because mm -hmm. uh, sometimes, you know, like, oh, you're just, you're being so stupid. Like, you know, <laughs> like, but I think that's part of it. I think when we think about our own adolescence, you know, um, I had a friend talk, we were talking about that at the time, like, uh, we were talking about you, like, you know, you're doing something like, you know, you're washing the dishes or you're going for a walk and suddenly you remember something you did in grade nine. You go, oh my God. And it was, like, it was so many years ago, but like, I think my friend said, I think it was my friend Jim McEwen said, uh, oh, it's like it hit me right in my cringe nerve or <laughs> my, yeah. my, my shame nerve or, or something like that. And so I, I as, as gross as it is, I, it's, I also want to leave that in. Yes. You know? uh, especially times when she doesn't act or she doesn't speak up. Because I, mm -hmm. I, think, I think it's important that we kind of realize the times, like we think about all the mistakes we made and deliberate mistakes, but also the times we were complicit or the times we didn't stick up for ourselves. Yeah. Uh, I think it's important to kind of have that. And because um, uh, I think those are the things that kind of can creep up, you know, on us, on us in our subconscious. Um, so I think it was important to see imaging through those things as well. Absolutely. Now, uh, will we get to see imaging as an adult? That's a good question. Uh, I don't have any plans for right. anything like that right now um no because i think it'd be a very different uh, story i haven't thought about what she would be like as an adult it's kind of fun to think about mm -hmm. um i usually tend to kind of by the time i finish one thing i'm so um i kind of like i, I usually i like to i like to put one thing down and pick something else up so yes. uh, right now no i don't have any plans <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was hoping, Bridget, that you could read a chapter from your book, and if you could just let us know before you start why you've chosen this particular section to share with us today. Sure, no problem. Um, so here's the book. Uh, the section I'm going to read is later on in the book. It's in the second half of the book. Um, and this is when she, Imogen has first started university. Uh, one of the reasons I chose this section is because, um, you know, this is kind of a moment she's been waiting for for so long. She's been kind of wanting to, you know, kind of get on her own and be a different person and be new. Um, but what I, what I also, what was, what's established here is, you know, just kind of like, so she's still having the struggles that she's still kind of encountering. And of course, as a being a poor student. Um, so a poor student in the 90s is... Uh, is basically the beginning of this. So it's the first couple, it's basically kind of an overview of her first semester at Memorial, Memorial University in St. John's. Back in September, Imogene would never have predicted how much time she would spend reading bulletin board notices. Large bulletin boards grace almost every landing of every building on campus. They beckoned to her, look at all of our options. Here are other people's lists for you. Party at the dining hall, books for sale, Participants needed for psychology experiment, Toastmasters course, looking for carpool, looking for babysitter, looking for love. Imogene stood before them, her new Memorial University backpack firm on her spine, craning her neck to absorb the plethora of goings on. She tore off tiny tongues of phone numbers for later, 
She shoved them into the change pocket of her wallet, like doing so would transform them into something monetary. During those first weeks, she invested in high quality bond paper and delivered her resume to every business from the square to the mall. Maggie and Robert had agreed to pay for tuition, but stressed that Imogene had to cover textbooks. She scoured lists of used ones for sale. She did the math and realized it was cheaper to photocopy anything slim and return it to the library. Now there's a way to save money for the weekend, the guy behind her said when she hauled out her crinkled packet of Othello in English 1080. But by Thanksgiving weekend, there was still not a single phone call or interview. Now that the cod is gone, everyone's just hiring their cousins, Rita said, especially in town, which Rita can say easily as Uncle Eli gives her whatever shifts she wants at the club, whatever matches her schedule when she's not in school. I bet some people back home are crying nepotism behind your back, Imogene said, and Rita didn't know what nepotism meant, and Imogene made sure to roll her eyes. By Halloween, bulletin boards just pointed out the range of experiences Imogene lacks. She's never written a review for a school paper. She's never participated in a French conversation language exchange. She's never sung in a choir. Volunteering at the radio station meant she would have to learn about actual good music. Things she might know if Nan hadn't refused to get cable. She is crippled when it comes to trying to access and play what is acceptably cool. There are audition calls for small plays. Theater arts was never offered out home. Meanwhile, it seems like every town he got that shit done in some Christmas concert. Maureen says the drama clubs cast the same bunch all the time anyway. Most aren't even students, just local actors who don't want to move to Cornerbrook and study theater. Then there are society mixers, all with hand-drawn photocopied signs. She imagines having to talk with interest about the mandatory history requirement with classmates who expect passion and in-depth knowledge then getting too drunk in the spirit of overcompensa overcompensation and being trolled out, patrolled out by sorry, university security. She refuses to be in any situation where there is a possibility she can be humiliated or branded. That is not what her life is now. But the Alumni Association Call Center didn't need experience. For almost a month, she spent evenings phoning former graduates for donations. There was a script on how to begin with $100 with $100 request and then work in how just $20 got the donor's name published in the alumni magazine. She hated it. With every call, she fought the impulse to say goodbye and escape. But Maureen's name was high on the list of top callers. Imogene had recognized her from English, English class where she had admired her hair from afar, her dark slick bob with one frontal stripe dyed blonde running along the side of her face like a strategic check mark of approval. At the call center, Imogene watched Maureen smile into the phone to change the contour of her voice. Off the phone, her natural expression is set on sullen, but that's just her face. Witnessing it turn from flat to fake, sincere, entertained Imogene. And then the library saved Christmas. A student assistant dropped out. Could she start right away? It's mostly putting things back where they belong. Yes, no problem, Imogene said on the phone. Thank Jesus. On the last day of the call center, Maureen said they should celebrate. At the breezeway, Maureen knew the bouncer and he looked the other way. She ordered tequila shots and retrieved two takeout packets of salt from her purse. You'd be surprised how many bars don't have salt, she said. How do you do tequila with no salt? Later, they went to an after hours party. And the following Friday, after their last class, they met up at the breezeway again. Draft was on for 75 cents a glass. They carried on regularly for the rest of the fall and over Christmas break. They both liked evenings with loosely made plans. They appreciated the element of not knowing what the night had in store. And then in February, Maureen's friend Sherry Duffy ended it with some guy named Rex and decided she wanted to go out with girlfriends again. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That was great, Bridget. You've just taken me back a few, quite a few years of my life. <laughs> I really like the title of your novel, Some People's Children. Um, is there a story behind how you came up with that? Uh, it took a while to, the, the novel was actually originally just called Imaging Tubs. Uh, mm -hmm. But my first novel, novel is called uh, The Greatest Hits of Wanda James. And it's like, you know, are you going to name all your books after the character? So uh, 
what I liked about, uh, I did, you know, um, some brainstorming and I made a list and some people's children is one of those things that um, uh, is kind of saying, you know, some people's children. So it's yes. like, you can almost picture somebody like, like out their window at somebody misbehaving or it, it kind of ties into gossip and complaining about other people. Um, and I, I kind of liked how you know, if I named it Imogene Tubbs, it would have been the focus just on her. And this way is kind of encompasses, I feel, so much more. So um, yeah. I was pretty happy with that one. Yeah. Yeah. And I as just, you said, oh, sorry. I, I just think I usually go through a bunch of titles. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not a natural when it comes to picking titles. I fix some pretty bad titles <laughs> and fortunately have changed them or uh, has, have, have followed suggestions that they be changed. <laughs> well, just as you said, I could totally picture someone wagging their finger. Just the, the title really does conjure up that image for me as well. Uh, now, I understand your first novel, The Greatest Hits of Wanda James, mm -hmm. I, um, was actually not, well, your first novel. You, fin you were working on a draft of Imogene first. Yes, yeah. Yeah, and I was wondering, why do you think uh, Imogene's story circulated for as long as it did before you were ready to bring it out into the world? Um, I think I got the idea for it. Um, I mean, it's, it, there's a lot of darkness in Imogene's story, of course, with the relationship with her, uh, the kind of non-existent relationship that she has with her mother and mm -hmm. everything kind of being, you know, tangled with that and her kind of making a lot of realizations about what it, something, you know, what had happened to her mother. Um, you know, and it, and it also takes place in a time where, you know, um, it's, it's, it's the late 90s, early, it's, it's sorry, the late 80s, early 90s. It's, it's uh, not a politically correct time. It's kind of, you know, a time of uh, great culture is kind of just taken for granted. So I think, uh, I, I remember I wrote a lot of it and I, I just, you know, I kind of went through, um, you know, oh, it's no good, and I put it down, and uh, and then I finally kind of, you know, it, so it kind of, you know, I would pick it up and put it down, pick it up and put it down, mm -hmm. and um, and then finally I I forced myself to kind of finish the draft, and I was like, just just finish it, just pick it up and finish it and do it, and so when I finished that, uh, so that took me, oh my god, I don't even know how many years it took me that, and then when that was done, I wrote Wanda Jane's in six months. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, so it was kind of like a practice, a very long practice. Yeah. And then I wrote the book that ended up getting published first. So, yeah. um, and I was actually doing a mentorship. I was with the Writers Alliance of Newfoundland and Labrador a mentorship program. And I was working, I was working on this with yes. Ed Kavanaugh when Breakwater contacted me and said they were going to publish one of James. So that ended up. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> becoming so yeah they kind of uh they they uh yeah i don't know yeah i guess because it just um there was so much because it was kind of your for my first book and there was so much i was trying to do yes. um and of course this covers nine years wanda james the great sense of wanda james happens in less than two months yeah so there's an yeah. event and then it, and then the end of the story so it's a it's it's it's, it's a one, one big event it's like a dropping on a big rock in a puddle and it's all yeah. the ripples on this one event. Well, this is something that does, it's, 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 it's what she has, it's her growing up and kind of coming to terms with who she is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. And what are you working on right now, Bridget? <sighs> what am I? <laughs> um, I wrote a short story collection that I'm kind of have submitted and I'm waiting to hear about that. Um, I've sold the film rights to the greatest hits of Wanda James and I've been working, thank you. I've been working with a producer to, uh, you know, so we've, so I've written the for the draft of the script. I think I'm on the second draft of the script for that. Um, so that's been, we're at stages of application with that right now. Uh, so, you know, fingers crossed. Yes. It's wonderful to, you know, be on a project where you're getting paid to you know turn your book into a movie it's absolutely oh. wonderful. uh so uh you know it I, I i i want so much to be excited about it but it's just such uncertain times i'm like oh i don't like you know yeah. but anyway i really really hope it becomes something um i really hope it becomes a film uh and i'm trying to write something new good yeah <laughs> <laughs> so you, very yeah. 
rough stage. Like I, I, I call uh, writing a first draft. It's like, it's like building a house and the first draft is like, it's just digging the hole. Yeah. The house was kind of going. So you can't even call it a house cause you're just kind of putting it down on paper. So I'm hoping to have that um, at a stage where I can call it, say the holes dug. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I'm excited for you and I'm crossing fingers, eyes, nose, toes and everything for you for your film. That's really exciting. Oh, thank you so much. Really exciting. And a great big, huge thank you to you for coming on today. I really appreciate you talking about uh, Imogene Tubbs. And what I will do is I will put links in the description box to your website and also to Breakwater's website. So anyone who wants to learn more about Bridget or to purchase a copy of her novel, all the information will be there. And everyone else, please come back next week. I'll have another author and another story to tell. So thank you.